Um, I've been doing this for uh, 28 years now. It was maybe a little over 28 years ago I, I bought this Superflow Dyno and built the, the fixture to hold the snowmobiles so I, we could do uh, uh, dyno testing. There, back then there was no place that you could go to, to uh, learn what was going on with the engines and try to make them better. But it took uh, a few years of testing and uh, burning pistons to try to figure out what all the, the numbers that this uh, computerized uh, fully instrumented dyno was telling us. I mean, we just they sell you the equipment, but nobody explains to you what all the numbers mean. So we had to wreck parts and try to figure out what was going on. And it was probably uh, two years into it. With I finally figured we had a handle on. We knew what the brake specific fuel consumption was to be safe, how many pounds of fuel per horsepower per hour, um, air fuel ratio, wh where we needed to be with that for, for good safe power. And uh, at the same time, I, I, I recognized the value of octane on these uh, racing engines that the, the local guys were building. I did a lot of work with Tim Bender back in the day. He was one of the first guys to be adventuresome and come here and try to make his awful uh, Yamaha stuff run better. He started with the Exciter engine and um, was very successful with it eventually from testing and testing and testing and burning pistons and testing. And was able to do uh, really good racing, uh, oval racing with that, which helped me out because it gave some uh, credibility to, to the, the dyno and the value of dyno testing. But uh, again, about two, year, two years into it, um, I had bought a drum of uh, C14 for us to use here. As a, as we needed high octane fuel for these guys. And uh, over a period of time, I'd, I used it, I don't know, it was down. Uh, considerably, maybe it was half full, I'm, I'm just going to estimate, but I was religiously resealing it. Um, and somebody came along and we, we burned a piston with perfect air fuel ratio, we had perfect brake specific fuel consumption, and low exhaust temperatures. I, I was really bewildered then, because I mean the numbers, I, I thought I understood the numbers, the numbers were right and the pistons were dry and stuck. And I was uh, uh, fortunate to have uh, gotten to be acquainted with Kevin Cameron. He was helping me with uh, Dynotech uh, the, when we were printing and mailing out the, the technical stuff that we're, we were learning about. And, and he explained to me um, that the fuel was stale that I had. He understood what had happened he, um, and that the front ends of the fuel were gone. Well, I didn't know what front ends were, but he spent a lot of time explaining it to me and printed some articles on it, and that's on my website now. And uh, so that, then we decided that we needed to pressurize the, uh, the drummed fuel to prevent the, the loss of the, the front ends that Kevin explained to us about. So that went on for years, and then and I saw more and more people coming here we'd have issues. There's, we had no way of knowing when a guy came here with his own fuel how fresh it was other than um, if we take a, a motor, if, if we, we take an engine, a race motor, that's say supposed to run at uh, peak horsepower around 90,000 RPM. What I'll do typically is I'll set the dyno um, controls to load it at about 7,000 RPM and what that does is I go full throttle and the dyno will keep it at 7,000 RPM regardless of how much power it's putting out. And and, some, and we, could, we could do this typically with, with pretty cool water for the drag guys, 80 degrees Fahrenheit coming out of the, out of the top of the motor. But every once in a while we'd, we'd get, get a motor where we'd load it at 80 degrees and we'd get this horrible misfire, sputter, sputter, pop. And even though the, the air fuel ratio was say 12 and a half to 1 inch, what, what was happening was we were getting a lean misfire. Now air and fuel uh, as, a, as a mixture has an explosive limit between 10 to 1 and 17 to 1. If the air fuel ratio is anywhere in there 10 to 1 rich and 17 to 1 lean, 
it will uh, it'll, it'll run cleanly, no no problem. But what was happening is because of the the poor volatility of the fuel that the guys had, the the, the fuel was not vaporizing the combustion chamber. It was wasn't vaporizing until it got out into the hot exhaust pipe. So what was happening is in the combustion chamber, it might have been twenty to one, lean misfire, pop pop pop, and and we just get the motor hotter and hotter. And we get up maybe to 120 degrees Fahrenheit or 130, and all of a sudden it would run clean. So now we know we were richer than 17 to 1. We're in there someplace. And it was always a crapshoot. So if, if, uh, if a guy had bad enough fuel where the meters are telling us 12 and a half to 1, but it's 16 and a half to 1 in the combustion chambers, we could stick a piston still. And fortunately, uh, um, we came up with this um, copper tube that you can see here, which is attached to a, a rubber hose, which is attached to a $2 pair of Harbor Freight uh, ear protectors, just a, a little hose fitting in there. And this gets attached to the head of the motor, and when they detonate from being too lean, say running 16 and a half to 1 or 16 to 1 at full throttle, it'll click we can stop so this this was a great great help but still it was out we were always fumbling around um, trying to, try to guess at what a guy had for fuel until I found this reed vapor pressure tester that we talk a lot about so now if if a guy's fuel is uh, stale we have to be real careful with it we'll get the motor real hot and really careful when we, we go full load with it um, because we don't we don't need it to to detonate. We just need the motors to run clean with with a proper air fuel ratio, and it takes fresh fresh high rate reed vapor pressure reed vapor pressure fuel to do that. So now now that we can test it, uh, if a, if a guy will come here, and this happens way too often, that a guy will come here with a a sealed five gallon pail of fuel, depending on where it came from, that'll be. Uh, very very stale and so that means that the fuel wasn't uh, taken care of properly whether it's from the the wholesaler to the retailer you know I mean there people don't don't uh, take the proper precaution they don't keep it stored in in sealed uh, drums under nitrogen to transfill into their own five gallon pails there's there's a lot of reasons for it but buying a five gallon pail is no guarantee of uh, of freshness regardless of whether it's sealed or not. Depends on the source. So the, the best bet is to be able to um, get your sealed pails from a place that gets it directly from the refinery. Or if, if there's a refinery that does put in five gallon sealed pails, that's that's the best. But when it goes from hand to hand to hand, it's a little bit scary. So you know, as I saw more and more of this happening, uh, that's when we uh, got going again with this uh, the nitrogen uh, fuel preservers that the the drum preservers what Carl McCullen calls them he, he has the the bungs made and put them all together and with these custom low pressure regulators and we're trying to convince people that they need this to keep their fuel fresh and and make sure they, they get drum fuel from a uh, a really good source so uh, that's that's the reason you know if, if we see what's happening we we see detonation happen when it shouldn't and it's always um, substandard fuel and it's it's not the acting of the fuel it's the lack of the front ends that causes the most grief if you go to the races say the snowmobile drag race is a good example people put their sleds up on a jack stand and whap whap and, and they got it they're gurgling and popping and and finally, the motors will, what they think, clean out. They think that there's a bunch of gas and oil down in the crankcase that's getting up there and uh, following the spark plugs. And But what all they're doing is getting the motor hot enough to vaporize and get their stale fuel to be richer than 17 to 1 in the mid-range. Now, I'm sure you, and you've, you've seen some guys that bring their sled to the line ice cold, ice water in it, pop it down, and they're ready to go. Maybe one quick blip to get the pipes warmed up.
but it, it's all due to the volatility of the fuel. And everybody should go to my website to the free blog. There's lots of good information on there, and one of the one of the best uh, pieces of information on, on there is uh, an article on fuel atomization uh, that Kevin Cameron wrote for us. It describes precisely what happens to the fuel to break it up into um, uh, small enough droplets that can become a vapor that can actually burn in the combustion chamber. So that's my uh, propaganda for now and, and, and now we're, we're going to uh, tap onto this uh, a little more information on the, the drum preserve and mixing some oil. That's next.